But you, know, you did, and you, but it, by that time, not only had, had, had a, Mr. Coleman wrote, wrote, written these reports, but also you were aware that there was something had to be changed, and you were very direct uh, in, uh, as you say in the book, holding parliamentarians to account and saying, that, you know, that we shouldn't be talking about this, we should really be talking about what's going on in Afghanistan, and you in Parliament should be talking about uh, you know, making sure the troops are properly equipped and the mission is going forward. Well, Jim, I didn't say they shouldn't be talking about it. What I said was that's all you're talking about. And you say that you're talking about it because you want to protect Canadian soldiers. Where were you, those parliamentarians, when we needed new fighting vehicles with the right kind of armor protection, when we needed night vision goggles, when we needed new aircraft, when we needed more money for training, more, more recruits to come in to do all the things that we as a country ask our young men and women in uniform to do, where were those parliamentarians then? And they were absent. Uh, they were not on the field of play. And I just said simply, if your reason is to protect Canadian soldiers, where there are a spectrum of activities, and to those young men and women going overseas and their families back here, the most immediate, the most urgent, and the most life-saving is the necessary equipment and resources and, and training to be ready to counter an enemy that's trying to kill you, an enemy that uh, we detain on a routine basis in those acts, killing Canadians are trying to do so. So I said, actually, don't just focus on that. Mm -hmm. Do something else that's also off value, and then I'll be with you. But did you still at that moment believe that the concern and criticism of the handling of prisoners was, in your words, bullshit at that point? Absolutely, because they were coming at it, in my view, from a completely partisan politics point of view. Uh, they really didn't care about soldiers being protected. That wasn't their, uh, their center of gravity. Uh, what they were trying to do was stick a flechette into the government of the day, and they would have rolled over any Canadian soldier to help achieve that, I believe. That's my view. And so I just said simply, look, if you're so concerned about protecting our soldiers, then here's the spectrum of things that you need to be engaged in. And how come, by the way, you know, in 155 question has, you know, 58 of them were on detainees, and three were about how we could help support Canadian soldiers with the right equipment, right training, and right leadership. I said, you need to balance what you do as a parliamentarian. We look to you for leadership, and we actually didn't find that leadership in very many places. I, I find it really, it was really a, perhaps coincidental um, in the book, but there's a long section where you talk about these issues, and, uh, and then, as I say, sort of coincidentally, it moves into the change from Gordon O'Connor as defense minister uh, to Peter McKay. And um, at that point, um, the Canadian government, first a liberal government and then a conservative government, had lost two cabinet ministers, two defense ministers to this issue. And I wonder um, if that was on your mind that day in Rideau Hall when you were there for the swearing in of Peter McKay. And, whether or not it was a top of mind issue for you when you started to, to discuss the mission and, and brief the new minister on those issues. I mean, was that a concern for you at that time? I mean, politically, two ministers have fallen into this issue. You have a new minister, quite a young, competent, very competent guy, but a young guy. You know, what was your, where, where did that stand in your, your concerns about the mission? Well, first of all, I don't necessarily think two ministers went because of this issue exclusively well, or solely not, or even... Not technically Gordon O'Connor, but then there's no doubt that his problems with this really undermine uh, the I mean, okay, so that's an assessment yeah. that you make, and well, I don't want to comment on that I one. Well, let me just tell you, we had a new minister that was coming in. We were in the middle of a war. Uh, we had young men and women in combat, and that's what we were briefing them on. And, that as the first priority, uh, transformation of the Canadian forces to meet all of our security needs back here in Canada and around the rest of the world as a second priority. And no, that was not a priority to sit down and talk to Peter McKay about who, by the way, again, my job is not to pat people on the back, but I think he's doing a damn fine job as the Minister of Defense for Canada. But So you did not discuss the, the prisoner ex uh, treatment issue with him when he became Minister? And not specifically the first day of minister. I'm sure over the yeah. periods of time we did, yeah, but that wasn't sort of the number one issue to go in and talk to him no, about. No, I wouldn't assume it wouldn't be number not one, but I, I would assume given the politics of the situation, the sensitivity of it, you would have at least discussed it. And, and I don't recall specific discussions with him. I know I did over periods of time have discussions on all of the issues that we were dealing with without question. Right. And the last question on this, because I, obviously there's so much to talk about, there's a lot of interesting things in the book, but 
Um, you, you famously referred to, and I, I know you know I'm going to ask you about this because I, I know you delight in talking about it, but um, you, um, uh, you referred to the Taliban as de detestable. I can't imagine what he's going to say here now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my question about this, and you have, you have been very consistent on this point, you've said you've never regretted saying it, it reflects your view, but I wonder now in, in retrospect and, and sort of in the broader context of the current situation, whether you ever think, you know, maybe that was a bit intemperate in the sense of a CDS suggesting a certain attitude towards the enemy that people in the in the in the ranks of the military might say, gee, you know, you know, they're detestable scumbags and murderers. We really don't have to treat them in a civil and, or professional way. And I know in the book you argue that consistently Canadian troops did behave professionally and consistently, but I wonder about that as a signal and whether you ever second guess yourself and say, that might not have been the right thing to say to a young soldier going abroad who was going to be engaged in a hearts and minds war with the Taliban. In fact, no, I never ever second guess that. You know, here's what I thought. Around Ottawa, nobody ever says anything that's real or what they believe or anything that you can actually later hear about. And you know, I was talking about people who were killing and trying to kill our sons and daughters. People who murdered older people, murdered younger people. I showed a picture today to a group of folks of a woman in Afghanistan being executed by the Taliban because she had been seen in the company of a man who was not from her immediate family. That's the kind of people I was describing. What do you think the soldiers would describe those people as when they're being shot at by them? And I, I balance that with the fact that we've got the best set of ethics and values incorporated into our training and development and education of the Canadian forces that exist in the world, that we've got the most professional young men and women who live by those values and their actions reflect the values. You know, you can't see values, but you can see actions and the actions that those soldiers take on a daily basis around the world uh, articulate those values in a very clear way. We've got professional leadership second to none. And we've got an oversight of that in the command structure that is superb. So I was never uncomfortable that those young men and women who are smart, imaginative, who are just proud Canadians were going to take my words to mean anything other than the fact that anybody who kills innocent people and does it on a routine basis is a murderer and a killer. I'm sorry, I don't know how to describe it any other way. No, I would be embarrassed if my mother showed up and said, you use that word, she would smack me on the ends, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, just one last point that I, I should have raised earlier. And, and, uh, I thought you said you'd finish on those questions. We're going to move on to something else. Uh, I'm from Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the points that was made yesterday in testimony was that one of the concerns was that not only are, are the issues of legality and civility and law and justice, and we're, we're in Afghanistan trying to develop a justice system which clearly would not in, include torture and abuse of, of prisoners, but there was a more practical angle raised, and that was this is not in our interest in a hearts and minds war to be associated with uh, torture of prisoners. And, you know, as often pointed out, you know, there are many reasons people get arrested in, in, in Afghanistan. They're not all Taliban. Sometimes, as, as Mr. Coleman said, they're taxi drivers and, and, and peasants who've been caught up in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so he was making the point that in a hearts and minds war, this is not a way to win hearts and minds. Can you respond to that? Sure. I mean, I, first of all, and I haven't heard all of Mr. Coleman's uh, you know, discussion and talk, et cetera, but he appears to have covered an incredibly broad spectrum much of which I'm not sure he's qualified actually to talk about, that he cannot say firsthand certain things. Yeah. Uh, we detain some people. The vast majority of the ones that we in the Canadian Forces detained were the ones we took in the middle of a firefight.